Okay, yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I want to apologize for the delay in the start. We had a little uh, hitch with the starting the Zoom call itself, but I'm glad that we are on air. And I would like to welcome everybody on this occasion of the UNESCO World Conference on Cultural Policies and Sustainable Development, Mondial Cult 2022. I am really honored to have us all where we are. And I'd just like to say a few words before I hand over to our moderator for today. If, you're, if you can see my screen, you note that there's a little change in the personnel, uh, it's a little different from what was earlier uh, announced, but we are glad that uh, we can have this uh, brief chat going on. So we have with us the Mozambican Association for Musical Arts Education, the Ghana Music Teachers Association, and Music Education Research Group Kenya, all under the provisions of the International Society for Music Education's Council of Professional Associations, that is the ISME COPA, delighted to participate in this Mondial Cult side event. It brings together music educators, music education researchers, arts educators, and education experts, experts or administrators to consider or to just um, think about how arts education does or can inform cultural policies and sustainable development. I believe that there will be definitions and perhaps application of terminologies that should give us scope for thought. Let me now welcome our moderator, Dr. Caroline Mose. She's a lecturer of performing arts at the School of Creative Arts and Media at the Technical University of Kenya in Nairobi. Carol, let me hand over to you. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Akuno. If you move uh, a little closer so you can be louder. Can you hear me now? We, we could do it with a lot of what more sound from you, unless it is my sound that is low. Okay. My, my sound is at maximum. So I really hope and trust everyone can hear me. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Professor Akuno, and um, welcome to all the members who have joined us from different spaces in different countries. Um, in Kenya, we say Karibuni Sana, that is uh, welcome. So welcome to this, um, this particular uh, uh, webinar. And um, as Professor Akuno has introduced me, my name is Caroline Mose. I am a lecturer at the Technical University of Kenya's uh, Department of Music and Performing Arts. And I will be the moderator for today. Um, as per uh, our program, what we are going to do is we will start with uh, our team from Mozambique and then we will proceed with our team from Ghana and then finally we will have the team from Kenya doing their discussion. And with us we have various uh, speakers and discussants. I will start with uh, the team from Mozambique. I will introduce um, them and then I will open the floor and ask them to begin with their discussion. Yes. Right. Um, yes. So as I was saying, we will begin with the team from Mozambique. I will introduce them. And then um, after that, we will then proceed with the team from Ghana. Now, in the interest of time, uh, Professor Akuno, uh, how much time are we allocating each each segment? The, the speaker has 20, 15 minutes. The discussants yes. each have 10 minutes. Yes, so um, as we have had speaker, 15? Yes. 20, 15, and then- 15, 15, 15. And then speaker, and then 15, yes. discussant, 20, uh, 10 each. Yes. 10 each. Right, so yes. I will begin uh, with introducing our team from Mozambique. Our team from Mozambique, please forgive me if I do not 
pronounce uh, your names as they, they, they should be. I will try my best. So um, the speaker from Mozambique is Dr. Luca Mukavele. And the title of the presentation is Music Education in the African Context. Dr. Luca is founder and leader of Mukambira Musical. Um, Mukambira is a private institution that, that works towards traditional music research and music performance development and innovation in Mozambique. He is a postdoctoral fellow and PhD in music at the University of Music Franz Litz in Weimar, uh, Germany. His interests are in mu ethnomusicology, organology, and traditional musical arts. He is a former lecturer at the Universade Eduardo Mondlane and an editor of the course Music in Africa at the University of Music Franz Liszt Weimar. Uh, joining um, uh, him are our speakers, uh, Mr. Joachim Borges Gove, who is a student, a PhD student in music at the University of Cape Town. Um, he has a Master of Music specializing in ethnomusicology from uh, UCT, and he's a lecturer at Universidade Eduardo Mondlane, and is the founder of SMEAM, which is the Mozambican Association for Musical Arts Education. And his interests are in musical arts education, uh, ethnomusicology and decolonization and speaking uh, alongside uh, these two as discussants is Ms. Praxedes Padina da Costa who has a degree in translation and interpretation uh, from Portuguese to English and vice versa an instructor and pedagogical technician his chief of monolingual department the Ministry of Education and Human Development she has worked as an English teacher in primary schools and secondary schools for a long time and her experience in the education sector spans over 18 years. So Dr. Luca Mukavele, Mr. Joaquin Borges uh, Gove and Ms. Praxidis Padina da Costa, welcome. We will begin with you. Uh, Dr. Luca, the floor is now yours. And to all the people who are still joining us, welcome, welcome, welcome. Dr. Luca. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Oh, Proceed. okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's much pleasure to be here in this event and uh, share my thoughts, my activities, and uh, yeah, and get involved with everyone. Uh, so let me just share my screen. I really have an echo of my voice. It's disturbing a bit here. Okay, let me see why that comes. Okay. But uh, now I'm going to share my screen. Uh, <clears throat> Do I have to be allowed to share screen? I think you're allowed. Okay, I'm clicking to share screen and it, it doesn't seem to be going. Share screen. Entire screen, okay. Allow. Do you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, which says University of Music, Francis? Yes, sir. Yeah? Yes, sir. Okay, good. So that's that. That's what I'm going to talk about today: uh, reflections, concepts, and uh, procedures. I'm disturbed by the echo. My my voice is being echoed. I'll take off the headphones, maybe. Try to see. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Yes. Um, 
let me move on. Uh, reflections, concepts, and procedures. And here I've got my sort of thematic rationale, whereby I try to lay down my ideas, my reflections, discussing concepts at the same time. Basically, what I'm trying to point out is sustainable development depends uh, on uh, the first step on the resources and the visions, visions and the objectives. Obviously, the visions, uh, the objectives are determined without the visions. And it's very important that both resources and visions consider ethical issues. And uh, going next, resources. For me, resources are those that do have affinity with the study, with the case, uh, the community. And, and it's important that they are available and renewable so that we can have a sustainable development. And there, then we know going down the arrow shows we can have a, a feasible, feasible resources the feasibility of resources for us to embark on a sustainable development. Uh, there are lots of other connections that would we'll spend another hour talking about here, but okay, let's not delve into that right now. So uh, for me, it's between artists, arts educators and policymakers, how to inculcate awareness of local cultural values in local policymakers rather than reading everything that is there, we will have a chance to read. I'll just pick out things in each, in each uh, paragraph, uh, let's say. So arts education is about helping people uh, uh, realize their aptitudes and develop artistic consciousness and inculcate artistic zeal in them, you know? And it's about nurturing their relevant skills that they can explore their artistry. So uh, it's important that we have this. And uh, yeah, artists as path openers do problematize, but they don't have to answer questions of whatever they, you know, observe in community, they, they, they develop their art on the inspiration it's this, this is a way in which they actually uh, stimulate the audience, the public to think beyond their conventional boundaries. <clears throat> and yeah, I always recognize that our environment is, is, is living, you know, it's on daily basis changing, it's breathing, it's all of that. So it's, so it's very important that we can interact with our environment in a, a dynamic, creative, and harmonious manner, which are part of the artist's modus operandi. Here I bring in an example. Uh, <clears throat> it's a piece of art from a Mozambican artist called Gonzalo Mabunda. And what, what Mabunda does, he picks uh, uh, debris from, you know, uh, the war, Hello? Yes. Go ahead, go ahead, Doc. Somebody um, was talking, I've muted them. Yes, please go ahead. Okay. So uh, in this piece of art, uh, Gonzalo Mabunda collects metal scrap and leftovers from the war, you know, bullets, and, and he makes his art, which is very interesting. In one way, he's addressing nature because he's removing danger that is there from nature, the pollution at the same time is uh, stimulating people, is giving value to this rubbish, a piece of art. Uh, 
in, in very high quality uh, at the same time they stimulate the audience someone who looks at this piece and see uh, you know those bullets on the face what does that mean people can make different interpretations so they are triggered to to think beyond so i think this this kind of art police makers should take into serious consideration because this will be very good to have children in schools to learn about this way of doing art but communities also addressing multiple issues of the society um learning from this example policy makers should support yes concepts for me concept carry visions and ideologies what is the, what is the concept of concept actually what is a concept uh, this this question inquires about our ideologies and visions uh, ideology is a system of ideas that guide our behavior our actions and visions as the ability to wisely imagine and think and plan the future wise, wisely so um yeah i think concepts are very important i'm not going to read there just development development there we start what do we want to become where do we want to go development is a process in which something grows or changes to become more advanced can always be influenced or distorted relations and all of that so it's important that before we talk about development we understand what to be advanced is likewise uh, the assessment of the concept of advancement continues challenging uh, yeah as assessing the attitudes decisions uh, made by our police makers sometimes you put a question mark in their concept of advancement what do they think it's advancement advancement for some is like to leave behind the tradition and move ahead and take whatever comes from uh, this uh, let's say the dominant world so i i look at that and i say you know this sometimes it's it's not beautiful to say this but it's like sometimes we have people who are conditioned you know they are conditioned intellectual surrogates of the west that believe that regressing to the europe of 2 or 4000 years ago is advancement this this is how much the concept of advancement can be detrimental if it's not clear uh cultural policy uh we won't much but we are seeing its programs and actions that regulate protect encourage and support uh yeah so it's very important team yeah in that site there it's discussed as a balance between the environment equity and the economy Uh, one of the most quoted definitions of sustainability comes from the UN Commission of the Environment and Development considering sustain sustainable development a development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs so sustainability is really about having using resources that are available and affordable yeah and technologies that reduce pressure on on in, on nature on the environment and in the society that sustainability can keep a practice going um in that regard 
sometimes I look at, for example, uh, the current massive unilateral importation of music instruments, for example, in, uh, in, in many African countries, it's, it's really inhibiting the development of local industry of musical instruments. Economically, it heightens the cost of musical practices, raising unemployment, frustrating music aspirants, and subsequently reducing local revenues from music. Environmentally, we also realize that this, most of these instruments come either by ship or by train, you know, polluting the air. And often the materials used to, to build these instruments are plastics, uh, composites of plastics, which are not recyclable. In some countries, in some industrialized countries, they have the recycling industry. We don't have this in our countries. So after an instrument is damaged, it's again going to add to the lichera, to the garbage, you know, that is polluting the environment. So um, from this, I'm going to go to the next. Hello, are we all there? Yes, we are yes, here. We are. Okay, <laughs> okay. So I also came up with an, another idea, which is auto sustainability. Uh, by auto sustainability, I really refer to that development, which is fair, this are supported with locally available resources. As I was, as I was indicating in my uh, rational, uh, schematic rational, it's important the resources are available for any to, to be sustainable. And oh, my please. Financial industry. Uh, in many cases, when we talk of cultural industry in our countries, in the case of Mozambique, and and as I've seen in many also other countries, uh, it's like cultural industries just focus to entertainment, to entertain tourists that are coming to the country to have good time. And I think this is wrong policy. We are just Uh, so, policies also promote the development of local technology uh, that people can be encouraged to invent their own working, working tools, uh, develop their own concepts of, hello, develop. Do you still see my screen? Yes, yes. We, do. we do. Okay, okay. So for me, it's important that uh, in when we talk of this cultural industry, we really Uh, Dr. Luca, are you here still with us or are you having, Dr. Luca? It appears Dr. Luca might be having some technological challenges.
Dr. Luca is seems to have Dr. Luca. Hello, yeah. Luca, are you still here? Yeah, I'm here. I we had lost you for a moment there. Um, and you have about three minutes left. Okay, uh, I'll just use those three minutes that are there. But I'm I see myself in my I see in the participants, I see everyone. Yes, because we can no longer see your screen. Oh, okay. I'll just talk. If you, if you can hear me, I'll just talk now. And if the screen is not showing me, okay. We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, I was talking of this uh, auto-sustainable concept of development, like you know, we must develop um, our own instruments. That's my principle. We must develop our own musical instruments as to practice music as art, to teach music also, and 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 to uh, to improve this technology in general to to make it uh, a sustainable an activity which can generate income for the practitioners. So I find that to be very, very critical at this moment. Uh, if that was allowing, I was going to go back to my rational scheme, uh, the abstract in the beginning, but uh, it doesn't seem to entire screen allow. Oh, because then I would talk on top of that. But given that, Time is so much gone. I would probably open up for uh, the discussants to to feature in and give their contributions. Hello. Hello, Prof. Luca. I can hear you. You can hear me? Yes, uh, I can. Uh, I just wonder if uh, I have to wait for for the moderator to, to let us in or Professor a, a lot of echo also. I'm hearing everything with so much echo. I don't know if don't everybody you have here. a cell phone. Don't you have any other device connected to, to the same I think Zoom? Since you, we you had two, in the beginning. Did you have two gadgets, Dr. Luke? It's one gadget. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, I, I can't see Carol, but uh, uh, Joachim, I think yeah. you proceed. The discussions proceed, isn't it? Yes, let the discussions proceed. Uh, Dr. Luca. Um, if you may, you are having an infinity window. I, it's or, just building. I see. Yes, it. You, you need to stop sharing screen for that to stop happening. Yeah. May I, while Dr. Lucas, since I will not share any screen? Yes, please proceed. Please. Okay. Hi, hello to everyone. Good afternoon and many thanks to, to this opportunity to share my thoughts in this uh, UNESCO's conference side event. It's a great pleasure to, you know, bring up what we, we think about, especially in my case, musical arts education in Africa. So within the scope of, of the cultural policy, sustainability and development through arts education, I will do kind of echoing Dr. Lucas address. Starting from his question, how to inculcate awareness, I'll say in arts education. 
and I will add to that awareness and citizenship through arts education, actually. From what Dr. Luca has just shared now, uh, I think one thing that uh, is, is happening, the good thing is that we are starting to talk about, about this issue and a very, from a very African perspective about the, the arts education itself, especially about musical arts education from a very African perspective, a movement that started in the early 2000s. And it's of course yet very little uh, academic production on this. So uh, one thing that comes to my mind from what Dr. Luca just brought up now is that if we need, we want to, 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 to develop, to come from the stage where we are now to, to the next level and in a sustainable way. He just shared here, for example, that piece of art. If we look at musical arts, I will take Mukambira, one of Dr. Luca's projects, one of the very, you know, the visible production from Dr. Luca in Mozambique, in which people gather there for studying, they do uh, artistic residences, they do workshops, they change so many, they innovate so many traditional musical instruments in order to bring them to the same discourse as those instruments we believe or we agree they are evolved. So if we think about maybe projects like Mukambira to replicate centers, if we had that possibility, centers or kind of, of, of musical arts museums where people can learn even out of schools or, or of the academia, the same way Mukambira works because from Mukambira, I know and I believe that so many people have started, have learned music from there. I would say that the curator actually is not, is not an academic, is not a scholar, but he teaches so many people, people about, um, about the Mira, for example, and he have invented, innovated so many musical instruments. So I think it's a way in which we can, we can help ourselves to, to come, you know, to move to the other level. Centers, museums, I mean, I would say for Shigubu, for Zori, for Makwai, all, all around, all over around. These centers would help, I mean, to inform us, the scholars, and to inform the schools in music education. So I think in order to make this happen, probably what we really need at the moment is a um, very strong advocacy and advocacy policy, which I think is favorable in Mozambique because our laws allow it, allow us to, to, to talk as we created the Mozambican Association of Musical Arts Education and the, the laws allow us to do it. And research is the other the other the other the other stream that i need with i think we need to to to, to reinforce um yeah i think these are my thoughts based on what dr luca just shared i'm doing my part as my research is is mainly um uh, focused to 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 musical arts education, to decolonization, and the indigenization of, of musical knowledge, which means that I'm looking at how to, to use the potential our own culture has to, to teach our peoples, our children, and, and why not? I myself started learning music from a Western perspective. And now when I think about music, um, 
uh, I, I, I don't think about music without looking at how we make sense of music. If I look at myself as an example, I say, okay, uh, my uh, music appreciation has been molded to understand music in the pers Western perspective. And I, 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 I did not have another choice. I mean, academically speaking, scholarly speaking. So, but now since I, I, I got this, you know, the, the opportunity to think from an African perspective, I think we can influence the future to the, the future music, music learners to think from a very African perspective. So these are my thoughts. Uh, I just wonder if I added something to, to Dr. Lucas' thoughts. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Borges, uh, for, for that um, addition to um, Dr. Lucas' presentation. Um, and thank you uh, for keeping uh, to the time. Uh, we will come back uh, to ask questions around uh, your presentation. Uh, but now I will ask um, Praxedes Rosina. Rosina, if you can hear me, um, please take the floor and lead us through your own discussion. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you very much uh, for making me be part of this uh, conference, this meeting, to share some experiences about arts education. Um, just to add to what Mr. Lu uh, Dr. Lucas has been saying, I'll focus mainly on to Mozambique uh, in a education area, how music uh, make difference in our country or to our students. Um, first of all, uh, I'll say that um, arts itself, uh, it represses local cultures where uh, we are allowed to, to speak our native languages, to practice our religions, and to play different types of music where we can express our feelings and how we can um, do something different to make students learn and understand some materials. When we go to the primary level itself, uh, most of our teachers use um, music or songs so that the students can learn when they want to teach, for example, um, uh, vowels, alphabet. So it's like music it brings a, 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 an innovation to our, to our teachers on how to transmit, on how to make students learn. Okay. And at the same time, uh, if, if uh, uh, we look at our, um, for example, at our uh, first cycle in our primary school, we have uh, Portuguese and mathematics uh, uh, subjects. And these subjects, what they do is music itself is integrated in these two subjects to make students to make them learn and uh, know how to calculate know how to write know how to uh, how to, to 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 i mean to to make some compositions things like those uh, on the other hand when we go to um physical education our students also learn a lot on different types of um traditions and uh, tradition dances where we have marabenta, where we have timbila. So it's like uh, uh, our students, when they grow, they uh, know more about how, how our culture is and they will uh, try by all means to, to respect our culture. They try by all means to be integrated to the society in that, in that way. So, since in Mozambique we have this cultural policy, which uh, reinforces the, the, the implementation of different cultures of different, or different arts in our country. So it's, um, it's a little bit uh, uh, makes our artists uh, flow more 
develop more and through different um different festivals where they can uh, uh bring together different artists they can also uh, uh, uh make many people come in and watch them and do what we call as uh, uh, fundraising so that they can uh, uh, um uh, are able to 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 buy or to afford some instruments to, to so that uh, they are able to, to to continue with with music and uh, maybe also using some different donors who are interested in in, in seeing our our arts education or our music uh, go ahead. So it's like. Um, music it, it itself when we go deep in the classroom it is used to reinforce learning in the classroom where more, more students learn better the contents through through singing so it's like this happens when the teacher introduces different type of uh, of contents uh, where you can uh, see that if for them to to be able to 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 um, to learn rapidly or quickly, they can use uh, these 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 uh, the, some different songs so that they don't forget the what what they learn. Um, on the other hand, um, looking at the sustainability, as as uh, Dr. Lucas was saying, we can also uh, find ways of recognizing those artists who are more brilliant and make them uh, uh, teach others or others uh, learn from them how to be how to produce uh, productive uh, instruments how to produce uh, good good uh, good good songs that all the society can can be able to to hear and and and, and like um also uh i would also uh, say that uh when we look at culture itself, this uh, in the society, it, it, it shapes inclusive and resilient society, you see, because this gives us an identity. When we leave, you go to any other country or to any other place, uh, the culture itself um, uh, uh, gives us this 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 stability for you to say no. I belong to this in this type of of area. Uh, and since Dr. Lucas and Dr. Box has already said many things, I will just stop here, looking mainly on the education sector. What music does for us? And uh, thank you for that. Thank you very much uh, for that presentation um, and for your contribution to uh, what the previous um, uh, presenters have said. I've particularly enjoyed uh, listening to you talking about how um, music actually creates resilient communities. For me, that's a very interesting uh, proposition. Um, thank you, Team Mozambique. Um, for your presentations. We will come back um, during the question and answer session from our listeners uh, to just come back and revisit if there are any questions around the ideas that you have shared with us. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now proceed to the team from Ghana. Team from Ghana is led by Professor Emmanuel Obed Akua who is an associate professor of music with 11 years experience of professional work and teaching at the University of Education in Ghana. Um, he is the editor in chief of the Journal of African Arts and Culture and professor has been involved in writing and reviewing books, monographs, executive manuscripts, including curriculum development for schools and colleges. Um, Professor uh, Emmanuel Lobedakwa is published extensively across the musical arts in both international and local reputable journals. He has led many academics in the development of arts and culture, as well as creative arts programs um, in the university. And he has held uh, leadership positions such as head of Department of Music Education, Director of Quality Assurance, and is currently 
the Dean of the School of Creative Arts and Design at the University of Education in Winneburg, Ghana. Uh, welcome, Professor Emmanuel. Um, with him is uh, Dr. Aram Eric Kwasi Fiagbedzi, who is a lecturer at the University uh, at the Department of Music at the University of Ghana. Uh, Dr. Fiagbedzi holds a PhD in ethnomusicology, also has extensive research and teaching experience in African diasporic musical traditions, histories, and performance practices. And he has a research interest in Ghana's cultural policy and the arts, and has also made, uh, uh, led many international and local workshops on improvisation and is a strong advocate for the inclusion of the arts in education. And finally, we have with within the uh, Ghana team, Dr. Eric Debra Ochere, president of the Ghana Music Teachers Association, chair of Department of Music and Dance, University of Cape Coast in Ghana, presidential fellow of the African Studies Association of the US, um, um, is an ISO Lomso Fellow of the Stellenbosch in Institute of Advanced Studies, Fellow of the Center for Advanced Studies in the Behavioral Sciences um, at Stanford University in the academic year 2020-2021, and is a focal researcher in ongoing research partnerships with the universities of Cape Town in South Africa, uh, Rhodes University in South Africa, Center for World Music in Germany and Maiduguri in Nigeria and his research interests in African music education philosophy, curriculum design and development, music and the SDGs, music psychology and music in everyday life. Um, Team Ghana, welcome. We will begin with you, Professor Emmanuel, um, who as the key speaker. Uh, Professor, take it away. The floor is yours. You have 15 minutes. Thank you. Hello, Caroline. Thank you very much. But uh, it's supposed to be Dr. Autre is the lead speaker. And therefore, um, I'll crave your indulgence to rather invite Dr. Eric Debra Autre uh, to make the presentation first. I'm just the, one of the discussants, please. Apologies for the mix up and thank you for the correction. Yes, I apologize. Thank you. No problems at all. Um, I have shared my screen. I just need a nod to see if everybody can see my screen. And then I move on. Yes, we I'm can. nodding vigorously. All right. So thank you very much for having me and the Ghana team. And thank you for the warm introductions. I'm going right away to speak about the three main sort of uh, concept areas in, in the overall team, arts education, cultural policy, and sustainable development. I'll try as much as possible uh, to give an overview and then uh, my able discussants will speak more in depth about details um, of some of them. So um, I'll speak about as education in Ghana, try to give a little bit of history um, so that uh, people can appreciate the context from which we are approaching the topic. And then we'll speak about Ghana's cultural policy document insofar as it relates to arts education, and then share some thoughts on sustainable development, the SDG goals. So um, here's a little diagram that I used to speak through a historical some retrospection on the, the history of music education in Ghana. Our first contacts uh, with with Europeans was in 1471, and that started with the Portuguese. And um, uh, we've cha they changed hands. We've had the Danes and the Dutch, but those who held this way for a long time were the British. And um, there were two strands, basically, uh, within which education evolved. The first strand being that of the missionaries, and the second strand being that uh, of the of the mercenaries, so those who came for trade. And there is evidence actually to suggest that uh, although we didn't have a centralized form of education, these two strands uh, started education in their own, in their bid uh, to promote their respective interests. So in the case of the of the missionaries, it was to win more souls, proselytize, and so um, they taught music as part of the 
as part of their activities, uh, teaching people to sing simple hymns and all that. And for the mercenaries and those who came for trade, it was more teaching people um, that, that the kind of skills that they would need to engage in sort of a, a more profitable trading ventures. But um, in the structure, what you see here then is uh, talking about a more centralized ordinance or uh, a policy for education. And the first one of those came in 1952. So Ghana has actually had a very, very long history of formal education. And in 19, 1852, uh, under British colonial rule, we had the first ordinance for public basic school education. And it's interesting that we often uh, uh, say that we had an official policy that precedes that of the Britain, although it was done under uh, British colonial rule, because the first ordinance for education in Britain was only passed in 18, 1870. And so um, technically, Ghana has a longer history of formal education, I mean, public education uh, than, than, than Britain. Anyway, so there were reviews of, of that in 1882, and there was another review of this education in 1887. 1908 and in 1925, which was the last educational review under colonial rule. And um, I'm speaking about the place of music in, in all these um, ordinances. Music was not really a central part of the curriculum in terms of having um, a syllabus that was followed strictly through the schools. So uh, music was more like um, left to the discretion, the content was left to the discretion of the person who taught the music during those colonial times. And it suffices to say uh, that the evidence suggests that the curriculum was more in line with the ABRSM or the Associate, Associated Boards of the Royal Schools of Music in the UK, which was run in the schools, in the schools here. Now, between 1941, a committee was set up actually headed by, by Ghanaians, two Ghanaians, but because of World War II, the implementations of this curriculum was only to be um, uh, pushed out after the World War II. In 1959, as many of you may know, Ghana attained political independence from the British in 1957. So in 1959, we had the very first, and that is why it's in green, the very first syllabus for music um, in basic schools which was actually published by the Ministry of Education, Ghanaian Ministry of Education. That was the very first time that we had a, a music syllabus. In between 61 and 1975, Ghana had a lot of political unrest. And with each of these different succession of coup d'etats, and a number of committees were set up to review educational policies and back and forth and so on. And all of them with the bid to make the, the curriculum more relevant to Ghanaians who were going through that education and to actually help reflect the new philosophical stance of the then governments um, to make it more pan-African. And so as part of the bidding um, and recommendations of, of some of the committees, in 1987, there was a subject that was introduced which was called cultural studies. And cultural studies had its aim and its goal uh, to bring um, into the curriculum, which was very Western-centric, some aspects of Ghanaian uh, aspect of Ghanaian culture. So collectively, they thought what really constitutes the Ghanaian culture were music and and drama and folklore and dance and also religion. And so these were the subsets of what made the cultural studies syllabus. And then the Music Teachers Association of Ghana uh, had a, a request, and the request was that uh, putting music as part of this sort of integrated curriculum uh, doesn't help to realize the full potential of music as a subject. This was heeded. And so in 1994, there was another uh, committee that was set up to come now, come out now with a music curriculum and music and dance became a standalone subject. And then until 2007, there was another major review where music was brought back to become a part of an integrated curriculum called the creative arts. And now we've just had a review of that curriculum as well. And music is still part of that integrated curriculum called the creative arts, creative arts and design. 
So that's sort of a very quick run through of you know where music has been, uh, particularly for uh, pre tertiary music education in Ghana. The case in the tertiary institutions is slightly different. So uh, the days that are in violet uh, in this diagram, 1975 and 2000, are the dates where we had uh, the first syllabus for the training of teachers. So syllabus for, the, for teacher training colleges, which was in 1975. And that was actually uh, reviewed in 2000. And with the current swing of um, educational reviews, those have also seen some changes, I'm sure, in the course of time. Uh, my discussants will be able to speak to that as well, or if people have questions, we can talk about it more. So here is a summary. Uh, music, the syllabi that has been pro provided for music teaching have been in 1959 for the basic schools and 1975 for colleges of education, 1999, a review of that of the basic school, and 2000, a review of that of the college of education one. And that those were when we had standalone music as a subject being taught in the schools. And on the right, we have 1987, 2007, and 2020, where we've had music as part of an integrated curriculum. First, as part of the cultural studies syllabus, and second, as part of the creative arts, which is uh, the current one that we are running. I picked this quotation that sort of summarizes and ushers me into the next line of uh, argument I want to make present uh, from Flolu and Amwa, who state that the history of music education in Ghana is not that of achievements and change, rather, it is a history of the difficulties. And it is a history of missing links between school education and local cultural environment, a history of the struggle of cultural identity and cultural preservation. Now, if we look at carefully at this, particularly the parts I've highlighted in yellow and green, they're already speaking to tenets of the sustainable development goals about the need for collaboration and strong institutions. Uh, in, and, and that pertains to whether it's a cultural industry or other industries between academicians and players, between artists and researchers and so on, in order to forge together a stronger uh, music education uh, in our case. And so I'll talk a little bit about the cultural policy of Ghana. Ghana does have a cultural policy document, which was preempted by UNESCO, a landmark UNESCO uh, publication in 1975. But um, the, the one in use now, the cultural policy document that is in use was uh, officially produced in the year 2004. And um, I know as I speak now, even today, there is a committee that is sitting on reviewing that cultural policy document to come up with a new one. And their, their first draft is supposed to come out after the, their meeting today in the public domain before it will be you know, implemented. So um, for now, it is the 2004 cultural policy document that has been implemented and been in use. And it had these three overriding sort of broad objectives to document and promote Ghana's traditional cultural values, to ensure the growth and development of our cultural institutions and make them relevant uh, to human development, democratic governance, and national integration, and to enhance Ghanaian cultural life and develop cultural programs to contribute to the nation's development and the material progress through heritage preservation, conservation, promotion, and the use of traditional modern arts and crafts to create wealth and alleviate poverty. Again, if you look at the, the, these sort of broad objectives, uh, you can see clearly how they tie in with the number of the sustainable development goals. And so the cultural policy document, if implemented well, uh, would have served a great purpose of helping to um, achieve you know, a, a lot of meeting the 2030 agenda. Uh, but um, are we on course? That is a whole different question. So our cultural policy document has come under a lot of critique in terms of its content, but even more in terms of its implementation. And um, perhaps that a few aspects of it will be put out there. Perhaps it's, it shares or resonates with the realities in other countries or other, yeah, other countries, and we can discuss that. So there are about 15 specific objectives. I'm not going to go through all of them. 
um, some of which pertain more or speak more about the arts than others. And, and here are some of them. I'll just skip those because of time and we can discuss more uh, in the end. If we look at UNESCO's um, Culture for Development Indicators, Ghana's analytical brief, uh, which, which sort of, I think is the most detailed uh, document out there that has actually um, put the cultural document, the cultural policy document under scrutiny, you will see that um, it has really performed well, mostly in, in places of governance and communication. But when it comes to arts education, which is in violet, the four bars in violet, uh, we, Ghana has not fared too well. I've isolated this for a closer analysis and look. And if we look at um, if we look at the results from that, it means that particularly with regards to culture, uh, arts education uh, in the formative years, Ghana has not done too well. And the implementation of the cultural policy document has not really worked out as it should. And uh, we are hoping that the new policy will help offset some of the deficiencies uh, in, in, in this document as well. So that leads me to speak about sustainable development goals. And I share uh, part of the thoughts that um, our initial presenters spoke about in terms of um, uh, the environment and, and making music, musical instruments and an awareness of that. So personally, um, our leaning and understanding of sustainable development goals in relation to the arts is not very different uh, from the, that uh, espoused in the Brandt, uh, Brandtland report uh, that development, sustainable development really is really development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This sounds very simple, simplistic, but it is quite difficult and an awareness of what it really entails is one thing saying it, but awareness of what it really entails and how it really plays out in, in, in art education and music scholarship is something that we need to really think through more in our bid um, to attain the sustainable development goals. So our extension of that, what we need to think about is or how we conceptualize sustainable development is thinking about how we make the arts and music increasingly relevant in the temporalities of space and time. And as I said before, that sounds easier than in practice. So an awareness of the paradox that sustainable development is in itself two words which are paradoxical because development development means quantitative increase to develop you have to you have to pull down something you have to cut down something or you have to modify something you have to you know put something else in this place and so on and how is that sustainable but so that moves beyond conceptions of preservation and conservation um and 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 the need to reflect in new light but uh, as I mentioned, the part that I highlighted in the cultural policy document and other things, it seems that um, there is still uh, isolating aspects of culture and preserving and, and conserving and these things. And I think that the question uh, for the food for thought is for us to really think about how we move beyond this. Those are important, but to start those seven as starting point, particularly in our bid and in the week to decolonize um, education, where we are thinking about how do we bring in more African relevance into the curriculum that is run at various stages? Is it just to bring, um, I think that the common ideas are to bring, uh, make African music, bring African music into the curriculum, I think to curriculumize African music. And that has lots of challenges. If we pick Ghana alone with uh, Ghana alone as a country which has over 50 ethnic groups and um, vibrant musical cultures all, all over, then whose music do you bring into the curriculum? Or is it just a question of teaching common principles which are then transferable to other musical things? So that is very much a question of power. Who has the power to, to curriculumize? Who has the power to select what goes into the curriculum? And if we think about our musical instruments, just like Luca mentioned, uh, most of our musical instruments that we need to preserve, 
uh, that are used in traditional musical forms are rhythmic instruments. In, in southern Ghana, we use a lot of drums, very big drums. And till date, to make a drum, we will need to cut down trees and uh, lots of trees to make just one drum uh, for, for instruments. Are there sustainable plans to replace these trees? Do we so the more instruments we produce, the more uh, the more trees we need to cut down in order to produce instruments, which are then used for the practice of our music and for the learning and for the research. And so these are questions that we need to be aware of and try to answer in our bid to meet, you know, uh, attend to the sustainable development goals. Because the colonization advocacies often, as I said, have been driven by concepts such as preservation, conservation, revitalization, and this has been the discussion. So um, there are a few points I will raise and then I leave that to my discussants and they will go on and, and speak about some of these. So I think that in our bid to, to, to curriculumize in the light of sustainable development goals, I like the metaphor that uh, Evan raises 2019 that the metaphor of the sustainable development goals as a sort of a lighthouse, the metaphor of a lighthouse. So we are in a messy sea because we are at different points with each of the sustainable development goals. Each of the different countries are at different points. And so when we pick, for example, goal four, which is quality education, we all know what should be, but what constitutes quality education? There are some who have more facilities. There are some who have more resources others less, staff to student ratios different, and so on. And so we, we walk at different paces towards the attainment of these goals. But like the lighthouse, as long as we know that if we paddle our canoes towards that lighthouse, we are heading towards the right direction and towards land. I think that is the metaphor that we, we go with as far as the sustainable development goals are concerned and arts education and music education are concerned. So, we need to be aware and accept the fact that the classroom is an inadequate space. And, and, and often, uh, I think that has been spoken about, and I don't need to belabor it. For African musical um, education, if we want to go in depth, then the classroom is simply not enough uh, to do that. We also need to be aware um, and accept the fact that our own experiences and biases accrued through our experience and training. The point I mentioned about, about power. And actually I like um, um, what um, a quotation uh, that was said, I think um, in relation to the colonizing African universities, uh, who says that um, no amount of radicalism in Western trained person can eliminate the Western style of analysis which he, he acquires. Right. And so if we are aware of this, I mean, then we that is a starting point to take it somewhere. I think we should discuss that. And then we, we and then in that sense, we think about stronger collaboration within and, and outside of the academic walls and in our bid to attain the sustainable development goals. So I will leave it here and then I will hand over to our discussants to pick aspects of this and, and, and talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Eric um, Debra, uh, for that interesting uh, presentation. Uh, we in Kenya currently are, um, are having a big debate and discussion around uh, our own curriculum, which is called the, the competency-based curriculum. And some of the things you mentioned are actually quite resonant um, in the light of that. And I think we will revisit some of those issues uh, when we come to uh, the question and answer session. Thank you very much uh, for opening that uh, very important discussion. Um, I will um, ask the, I don't know if it's Professor Emmanuel or if it's Dr. Eric Kwasi who is doing the next presentation. Yeah, sure. Uh, take it away. Uh, you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline. Um, it is actually a great joy to be part of uh, uh, this great discussion on the topic that actually has the propensity to propel the cultural policies and sustainable development in the arts education. Uh, Dr. Eric Debra Autry has actually hit 
you know, the nail right on the head, um, expounding on such sustainable musical arts education that inform policy directions uh, for every nation and particularly also for UNESCO. Indeed, uh, there are many prospects in the musical arts that inform uh, policy uh, making, especially curriculum framework in Ghana. And that is very critical in defining the future prospects of the young people. It is only when the policy framework reflects you know, um, in education and faithfully implemented that the young people will be nurtured into being honest, creative and responsible citizens. And that's supposed to mean that uh, you'll be able to make meaningful contributions to, the, to, to, to society. Thereby creating the intended outcomes of contributing to the achievement of national development priorities and global sustainable um, development goals. It will be very essential step to take in ensuring that all learners in our schools receive high quality education um, in the arts, of course, I mean, and especially also in the music education, ensuring that each learner reaches his or her full potential. In fact, the National pre tertiary Education Curriculum Framework in Ghana, for instance, sets out the conception of standards and the learning outcomes to be captured in the subject curricula that are to be achieved by all learners. The focus is more on performance standards. In fact, performance standards rather than objectives, which is good. Now we have read the, we have read that the, the new SHS curriculum, which uh, Dr. Autry actually spoke about in terms of um, reviews that are going on in Ghana. We learned that it is both terminal and continual that students who have been empowered enough to begin adult life soon after school. They go to the world of employment or continue to specialize at the university, whatever they want to do. Now, the arts education, I mean both visual arts and performing arts have been well-defined where students will be provided with that unique skills to enable them have some lifelong learning. But it is worth noting that the concept and ideas of sustainable development is, is actually not new. You see, in recent times, it has acquired new impetus, becoming one of the most discussed and written subjects. And everyone is not left out from this debate. Intellectuals, as well as ordinary mortals all across the globe are engaged in this debate. United Nations, international agencies, NGOs, national institutions, governments, and civil societies are actively participating in this intense debate. The truth is that, yes, it is possible and viable. Unfortunately, most of these simple truths have remained obscured under the shadow of plethora of documents and declarations written in highly technical and unintelligible jargons. So we are talking about the, how, how paradoxical uh, some of these uh, sustainable development goals are. Indeed, this cements the paradox of sustainable development. If these great ideas are just on paper without pragmatic effort by institutions, agencies, and other corporate bodies to see to its implementation, it will be problematic. Because the significance of the music education, the arts education, the performing arts in the Ghanaian society, and in the formal education has not been highlighted in the major education policies in Ghana and has therefore not benefited from the educational reform policies, as Dr. Ochre actually highlighted. People believe that after all, everybody can sing, everybody can dance, everybody can play some music instruments and take part in dramatic performances without going through any strenuous training. We forget that the musical arts play a monumental role in the planned sustainable development goals which we seek to achieve. Caroline, let me quickly look at a study that, that was actually done by some scholars to analyze the manifesto's promises of the creative arts sector in Ghana. 
So with the creative arts, you have the visual arts and the performing arts of which music actually plays a role. Indeed, governments upon governments are not oblivious of the sociocultural and economic potentials of the creative arts and the culture sector of which music education is part. They know that within the globe, and especially as lauded by Sustainable Development Goals of UNESCO, investing in the arts education and the creative arts sector is likely to sustain economic growth. They found out that, these scholars found out that as part of the campaign promises of political parties, promoting the entire creative arts sector is actually articulated. The challenge is that we are collided with implementation problems including inadequate facilities for teaching and learning of the musical arts in schools, leadership deficiency, funding, and infrastructural problems. And that suggests to me that the enforcement of policy considerations regarding the growth of music education in Ghana and by extension West Africa is on the lower side. So Caroline, let me say it is evident that the absence of national music education, or let me say creative arts policy a conscious plan for rapid development for sustainable goals has provided middle of the road art policies, which have largely remained unfulfilled over the last you know, uh, two decades. So Dr. Autry raised certain points to, for us to ponder in the characterization efforts that he mentioned that awareness and acceptance of the classroom should be as an inadequate space is one. And then there should be an awareness and acceptance of our own biases accrued through our experience. In fact, he spoke on stronger collaboration and synchronization of efforts among institutions. These are very legitimate points. What I can add is that considering the wobbling state of music and music education development in Ghana, which Dr. Uh, Autry actually you know, gave us, it is recommended that Clear policy consideration for the arts and music education are established. And if we can have legislative instruments for the desirable implementation and enforcement that backs it, things will change. And let me add that it is only through this that we can experience transformation in the arts and music education in Ghana and West African continent to reposition the musical arts in our pre-tertiary and tertiary education in order to contribute to sociocultural and economic development enshrined in the sustainable development goals as espoused by uh, UNESCO. Ideas without institutions will rather make the SDGs paradoxical. Hence, the institutions need to be strengthened in order to enforce such beautiful uh, ideas that are on paper. Thank you. Thank you very much um, uh, for, for, for that, Professor. Um, interesting, interesting contributions. We will come back to them during the question and, answers, uh, and, and answer session. Uh, I do suspect there might be quite a number of, of questions around that. Thank you, uh, Professor. Thank you. Uh, do we have um, Dr. Eric? Um, are you? Yes, please. Uh, are you, are you the Yes, please proceed. The floor is yours. You have 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. And hello, everyone. So I'm happy to share my thoughts on Dr. Autry's speech. Um, it's a very thorny issue when we're talking about cultural policy, arts, and our educational system. So um, Ghana, for example, has had a very checkered history on cultural policy right from 1957 after Ghana had independence and Dr. Autry has really delved into that. So the focus of my, um, my uh, what do you call it, my intervention will be on the 2004 um, cultural policy document, which is the current one, even though um, there is yet another review ongoing, which uh, is expected to end soon. Now this cultural policy it recognizes the fact that cultural education, or it is important that the youth and the general public 
are impacted positively with the cultural values and the sustaining cultural institutions and practices so that when they know this, when they are educated on this, they will cherish the cultural values and they would behave, they will have a changed behavior which will really go a long way to, to support or showcase the, the, the cultural values that we have here in Ghana. So then the document proposes a, three, um, a threefold approach to this cultural education. The first is through formal education in schools, colleges, and universities. The second is through formal education. Sorry, the second is through special education. So this special education is for artists, musicians, and other experts in the cultural industry. Then the third is through public education. This is where workshops will be held, um, open forums on the media and, and all that. But for the sake of our discussion, I would want to, um, to narrow down on the um, on, on the first on the first part, which has to do with um, formal education. Um, co colonialism came with a lot of baggages, and the main idea was to 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 disabuse or reorient our minds against our, our cultural traditions and accept other forms of culture, which uh, mostly was Western uh, culture and all that. So the, the, the idea of the, this policy is to really change that. And then, so the policy um, expects that the national, the, the Ministry of Education will collaborate with the National Commission on Culture in preparing the national curriculum so that there will be a deliberate effort of ensuring that issues of cultural education are part of the curriculum. Curriculum, the textbooks and all that. But what do we see? The documents have very fine uh, strategies and approaches, but implementation challenges. So what happens is that after this is done in the classrooms, you realize that teachers do not have the expertise in teaching the subject, if it's music, when it was music as a standalone subject, the focus was on Western music skills and all that to the neglect of a lot of the cultural um, music. Then when it was changed to the creative arts, there, there was another challenge where teachers will pick and choose which areas they are comfortable with and they teach the children these. So if the teacher is comfortable in basketry or drama, that will be the focus. And that teacher or educationist will not touch anything music. At worst, schools and headmasters regard the music as Friday singing. So every Friday when they go to school, they have a singing period, one hour, two hours, and they, they do this. And this has been a challenge and we need to move move away from this it is good to have integrated um, music as an integrated uh, what do you call it art uh, subjects with all the other aspects but conscious efforts need to be made to ensure that teachers are well trained to handle if not all these areas at least most of these areas or more than one teacher is employed to ensure that all the areas are taken care of because the children or the students that are in the class, they may have their different talents, but if they are not exposed to these creative arts, it will be difficult for them to uh, identify and develop the specific talents they have. There is also no cohesion between acad academia and industry, or a lot of the things that are found in the curriculum do not resonate with, with current trends, and in some cases, the cultural environment in which uh, uh, we are, or the schools are. So there is the need 
to actually take a second look at it and ensure that as much as we say we are in a global environment and we need to advance, we, should, we shouldn't leave our, the baggage we have as our cultural music, our cultural and related arts, we need to move along with them. On the issue of colo, uh, decolonizing the music curriculum, it's also a very complex and complicated issue, as Dr. Autry um, made us to, to believe or had told us. The challenge of globalization. So, for example, what is happening now is that we have our traditional instruments, instruments that are unique to the environment in which they are. The tuning systems are based on the language and the philosophy or ideas of the local people. But because of globalization and the, the need to standardize, as we keep saying, standardizing the instruments, standardizing the instrument. So then the instruments are now tuned, are now tuned to fit uh, with the Western instruments, for, for example, so that they could be able, they could play them with other instruments from the West, which in each case, is a good thing that is innovate, innovation and creativity. But then whilst innovating and creating, we shouldn't also lose sight of where these instruments are coming from. We need to take into consideration the uniqueness of the instruments and the, and the cultural setting within which they are coming from. And when this, is, 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 is noted and amplified, what will happen is that we will have what you may call, well, maybe world music or the contemporary form of what used to be. Because when we talk of preservation for the cultural policy, it doesn't see preservation as something static, the culture to be static, no. It, it, it identifies or, or recognize the fact that it needs to change. But whilst it is changing, there should be deliberate efforts not to go far away from what the uniqueness of that musical instrument is. And this goes also relates with other forms of the performing arts and all that. In our higher institutions uh, too, yes, there is a, a lot of focus, for example, where I am, in the uh, first year of the students' um, music lessons, what they do is introduction to music. Even though it's introduction to music, you see that it is more tailored or focused on Western concepts of music, lines, scales, uh, whatever, dominant seven, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of these students are not even aware of the music traditions that they have. They are not aware of the tuning system, the skills and the ideas and the values that come with these music traditions. So a conscious effort needs to be made to blend these because where I am, it is only in level 300 that the students, the student now gets access to learn traditional music in Ghana or uh, music, music in African cultures. And this is not very good for us if we are thinking of decolonizing our music curriculum and also ensuring that our young people learn their culture and their musical arts and practices. I, I'm sure I will pause here and wait for the next session where uh, questions and answers uh, will be given. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, right on the nose in terms of, of, of time. Um, I will encourage um, all our listeners and all that have joined us to hold on to your questions. Um, as the team from Kenya does their presentation, and then we will have a general discussion, and then we will close. Uh, allow me to introduce the team from Kenya. Uh, we have, uh, the, the, um, in leading the team, we have Professor Emily Akuno, her, her presentation is titled Education in the Arts and its link to the human experiences of culture and development. 
Professor Akuno is a professor of music at the Technical University of Kenya in Nairobi, having been a founder member of that particular um, of, of, of the Department of Music and Performing Arts at that university. She is the past president of in the International Society for Music Education, ISME, and also the past president of the International Music Council um, that is um, in Maison de UNESCO in Moilois, in, in Moilis, in France. Um, with Professor Akuno, we have uh, Professor Timothy Njora. Professor Timothy Njora is, has a, a doctor of, of musical arts from the University of Oregon in the USA. He has more than 30 years of teaching and research experience um, at several universities, including Kenyatta University. Um, he has been adjunct professor at the University of Western Oregon and Northwest Christian College. Uh, both in the US. His areas of instru instructional interaction include music theory and counterpoint, music composition, history and analysis of European music, sound studio composition techniques, and piano instruction. He also has extensive administrative experience, uh, including being chair of Department of Music and Dance for eight years. Um, Dean School of Creative and Performing Arts and has been active um, in terms of having um, administrative roles. He's been um, in, in, in Senate and Vice Chancellor committees He um, and been on national committees charged with different terms of reference uh, with regards to administration and policy responsibilities. Uh, welcome, Professor Njora. And with them, we have Dr. Mukasa Wafula. Mukasa Wafula has a PhD from the University of Music Franz Liszt Weimar in Germany. He's got a music, he's got a Master of Arts in Music from the Kenyatta University here in Nairobi and a Bachelor of Music from the same university. And his areas of interest include transcultural musicology focusing on aesthetics of music performance in African musical arts. And Dr. Mukasa Wafula is currently a lecturer in the Music and Performing Arts Department of the Technical University of Kenya. Team Kenya, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Mose. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. And for some of you, good morning. It is such a, a privilege to have so many of us on this forum. I am especially grateful for two of my own professors who are here, Professor Kidula, Professor Njora. It is a joy to have you in the forum. And our colleagues from Brazil, I have noted uh, Magali and uh, from other parts, I cannot quite tell where, but thank you so much for coming. It begins to feel as if we should have had this for three days, but anyway, three, two and a half hours we'll have to do. Education in the arts and its link to the human experiences of culture and development. That is what I would like to talk about. And I'd just like to appreciate again, everybody who's here. By way of preamble, um, talking heavily about Kenya, where we have a music policy and we have a culture policy. And these state the desire to propagate and enhance culture among other um, articulations in the two policies. Our constitution 2010, article 11, recognizes culture as the foundation of the nation and also cumulative civilization of the Kenyan people. Through this article, the government is guided to promote all forms of national cultural expressions. I like those three words. And to protect the intellectual property rights of the Kenyan people. I quote, well, I refer to Kidula 2014 and Otieno 2017. They each present a very rich history of music and theater education, respectively. 
And in their documents, the question of what is Kenyan is pretty evident. And Kenyan does not just refer to belonging to a physical space, but it speaks to a way of seeing, a way of being, a way of presenting oneself, a way of presenting one's perspective. It connotes the diversity of culture that one finds in the country. Let's talk about arts education. And, and I think of it as an avenue through which the promotion of the forms of national cultural expressions can be enhanced. And yet this is perhaps not fully absorbed, not fully exploited, not fully explored yet. It is important, I think, to start by articulating what these cultural expressions here equated to the arts are. The artistic expressions of Kenya's people take the form of both tangible and intangible emblems. So we've got visual, oral, and material objects. Um, with our many linguistic communities, we have developed expressions that speak to, speak of, and speak for our experiences our aspirations and our expectations. And these are the avenues that we use for deciphering what it is that constitutes the values of our communities, what it forms our views and how we project our worldview and perhaps also how we negotiate day-to-day -day tedium of living and relationships. By way of definitions, I think I, I just articulate um, my observed outcomes of the engagement with the arts in an educational environment. I do not think I go in for textbook definitions, but perhaps but after this, this could be textbook definitions. So I consider arts education as empowering individuals with knowledge, with skills, and with courage to express their mental or emotional impressions using symbols for which there are some meanings, some meanings have been agreed upon. It's also training people to develop and employ their creative abilities in ways that, and in order to reach and or influence others. There is some communication there, but perhaps it is also teaching of concepts, training skills, schooling attitudes, and encouraging creativity. What about if we thought about it, what if we thought of it as supporting individuals' efforts and guiding them towards self-discovery? And as we consider arts education, the education element in the arts is very crucial, especially when we consider education as socializing, as getting individuals to be self-aware, to be efficient, to be interdependent, and to be sensitive to issues around them so that they can prefer solutions. So arts education then is an enablement, is that English? But it enables individuals to be these things through exposure to and diligent study of the arts. And I believe that arts education contributes heavily. First of all, there's this discipline. As individuals engage with the arts, you're disciplined to focus, to imagine, to reproduce, what is in your mind to analyze, to articulate. So arts education contributes discipline to the individual, but they also demand and develop skills, analysis, observation, ability to relate part to part, synthesis, ability to see the big picture and to look ahead, which is all based on prior experience and therefore perhaps the ability to predict possibilities based on the common practice or prevailing circumstances. So these are all context informed, but maybe one thing that perhaps we talk about a lot is that the arts train values and attitude. The value of collaboration, the value of communality, this is uh, cultivated in our ensemble activities, respect for the other, an attitude of seeing through others' eyes as we engage with their art, an attitude of resilience, an attitude of striving for excellence. But what dimensions do I find very significant? What dimensions of the arts and arts education do I find intriguing? At the moment, we kind of find that arts are available. Ubiquity, 
which does not really translate to efficacy or quality or excellence. There is an abundance of arts. When you travel around Nairobi, all those beautiful graffiti art on the vehicles, we see drama portrayed, not just on TV, but even as you're passing in the streets, you find people interacting in ways that you just want to stop and watch. How about the sound? So much music in our environment. And the fact that, is so, that there's so much of it does not always translate to access to quality art. But there is another element of, of uh, abundance or of availability, the skilled practitioners. And I find here perhaps um, something very positive for us as we consider contributing to, the, um, to developing policies that these many skilled and experienced practitioners are able to and do provide aesthetic experiences to thousands of people on a daily basis, but they also provide um, mentorship. They are able to educate those who are upcoming. Let's talk briefly about sustainable development. And I quote Heineke, uh, uh, forgive my pronunciation, um, he talks about arts in education as encouraging bottom-up development as the step beyond theater for development. Kenyans, please, I that is not a political statement, bottom-up development, as I talked about it. There's nothing political about it. But Heineke argues that theater for development which has been used as a technique for teaching core practices towards change of perspective, procedures, and behaviors can go beyond that. And some of us might recall that things like agriculture, sex education, HIV AIDS, human rights, hygiene, ETC, have been popular theater projects under the broad term development, often sponsored by an international non-governmental organization. Despite the criticism of the word development, um, which has some colonial undertones at times, which imply a hierarchy or superiority of communities and cultures, where some communities are developed and others need to be developed, and that is very eloquently put by Heineke, I find that there is scope for the application of the arts to educate communities towards sustaining their development and I focus on the word there. Why do I say there? That possessive pronoun, I use it deliberately to denote a prerequisite for sustainability that emanates from ownership and ownership's byproduct responsibility. That will be dealing with homegrown concepts and procedures, not anything that has been brought in from an external space that we'll be dealing with traditions that are not in, imposed or alien, including ideas, practices, language, that are respectful of the actors and their way of doing things, that will be focusing on sustainability, forward-looking, and thus calling for and leading to the development of some fundamental systems and structures, fundamental attitudes, fundamental principles and philosophies that would foster the recognition of self and respect for the other, that would promote healthy relationships with others. And it makes me think of Nzewi's um, um, talk of the humane attributes of African musical arts education. So basically thinking, uh, speaking to projects and programs that are designed to tackle procedures, concepts and standards, which relate to our problems and challenges today. And, and um, again, Heineke, uh, no, De Ritu, De Ritu 2011 reminds us that society has stretched the function of art, healing rates through performances. And so we look at arts function in development landscape, not only as a tool for communicating innovative messages as De Gaulle 2003 told us, but also in developing skills and attitudes without which much development would really not be achievable. 
Sustainability will need to tackle matters of equity and social justice when it comes to access to resources, because the voices that need to be heard in matters of sustainable development are the voices that should be provided for in matters of um, it, within the policy, articulation of the policy. So we want to talk about arts education and sustainability. Arts education should be leading to sustainable development because of arts education's capacities and the claims that it, that it makes. Owino 2014 refers to musical arts as agents of socialization a characteristic that it no doubt shares with other art forms. And I'm glad to see our colleagues from the visual arts and from design also in the house, as well as the creative uh, performing arts theater. So the arts train what I call sensibilities, sensitivities and capabilities. What is it to be sensible, to be knowledgeable? So we deal with cognitive development of society the arts then allow us to make decisions based on knowledge. But to be sensitive means to have values that enable positive relationships. That's respect and regard for self and for the others. In short, arts education should allow us to choose what to do using what knowledge that is appropriate. To be capable, is it to have skills, to have abilities, to use knowledge, and to perform tasks appropriately. So this allows us to engage with knowledge through activities that demonstrate understanding and responsibility. So we train concepts, we engage with knowledge. We educate and school discernment and attitudes. We train how to, the abilities to perform tasks. The arts therefore make us aware of our environment because they train us to decipher the content of our environment and to appreciate the relationships that hold the content together. They also uh, train us to devise strategies for maintaining the content or to adapt that content in response to our emerging needs, that is creativity. The first was analysis really. And then they also enable us to, they train us to implement whatever plans and activities we have developed while respecting the context of our operation. So we have this um, analysis, creation, implementation, and ever rotating tri-star of sustainability through arts education. This model is something that we see every day in um, uh, creative process theories, so there's nothing new about it. But I find it very valuable as a tool for considering the role of the arts in informing cultural policies and sustainable development. There is continuous activity. There is, it, it is dynamic. We do not sit in one place and stop. In the words of um, uh, Heinecker, again, performance and other cultural techniques and other cultural techniques are the arts, seem to be predestined to create spaces for education in the sense of Bildung, the German term, where the students play an important role in questioning what and how they will learn. So the sense of this notion is that the arts enable philosophical and pragmatic knowledge acquisition. This supports my take that the arts are able to sensitize people to intellectually consider the substance and methods of the engagements and therefore contribute to both policy, for policy formulation and action towards culture and development. For such abilities to be nurtured, arts education will need to be systematic and should be conceived of as a process of building knowledgeable and responsive citizens who will take responsibility for and action towards informing policy articulation and sustaining development. Let me conclude. Why, how the arts education, how arts education relates to cultural policy. And I think that the first way is that it gives us a rationale for developing cultural policy because it speaks to what people do and often demonstrates why and how they do it. 
It also speaks to and of culture. And education in the arts is an education towards intelligent and meaningful engagement with culture. The how, it enables us to adopt inclusive practices in the development and implementation of policies. The what, it reveals to us the scope and content that the policies might cover. Let me express that a little more. Arts education covers materials, contexts, processes, and procedures, impact, and value, among others. These are crucial for handling the scope, articulation, and implementation of policies. There are two crucial elements that I, I wouldn't want to leave untouched. Cultural policy will need to be cognizant of the country's rich social cultural heritage that has influenced current practices, including those practices and the heritage that uh, affect education. I think that an education policy that ensures culture as forming a core anchor for especially arts education is crucial. Similarly, a culture policy that emphasizes arts education is valuable. Allow me to stop there and allow the discussants to also add their voice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Akuno, um, right on the nose in terms of time. Thank you for that um, uh, presentation. Uh, Professor Njora, are you with us so that you can begin your own contribution? Welcome, Professor. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm there. Okay. I, I just want to, I can go on. Yes, go ahead, Professor. Okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to observe one or two things. I will respond to some of the issues our good professor, you know, talked about, Professor Akuno. But I just, I'm here also with my wife, uh, her name is Dr. Jora, and she observes that today is the 22nd of September, but the year is 2022. So I'm sitting here and thinking, this is very interesting, that whatever decision the policy has to grow out of this webinar, it would be nice to be dated this because it's a very unique date. So that's just a quick observation. So let me also recognize the, um, the people who are attending this conference. Uh, and I'm, with that regard, in terms of policy, in terms of going forward, I'm very grateful for Professor Akuna because she is so multifaceted in so many ways, the activator in terms of uh, you know, the policies, in terms of thoughts going forward. So I'm sure she will, it will crystallize into some very deeply meaningful way forward. I want to recognize all my colleagues. There are so many I saw on the online and my graduate students uh, who are attending this webinar. It's a good place to share. So allow me to just approach my, my presentation as a way of thought, a thought process, food for thought, if you prefer. And I want with two quotes. One of them is anonymous. I was just reading. It's about culture. It's not due to enter the house of his wisdom, but rather leads you to the threshold. It's an interesting thought process that you are not just invited to the wisdom because I guess you it will be a smaller gift. But if one is invited to the threshold, to the house, in other words, you are welcome to explore the possibilities of this wisdom. And culture does have a very big anchor uh, in terms of this, uh, what we consider the traditional or out kind of wisdom knowledge. And then I also want to quote uh, a gentleman here called Paulo, Paulo Coelho in the book, The Alchemist. This is what he says, culture makes people understand each other better. In their soul, it is easier to overcome the economic and political barriers. But first, they have to understand that their neighbor 
is in the end just like them with the same problems, same questions. So as I listen to the eminent gentleman who presented today from Ghana, from Mozambique, I, I see a thread of issues, the way culture is perceived, what is the role of culture? What do we need to do about it? How does it interact with the educational institutions? These questions sometimes, we in Kenya, maybe when you beat your drum, we only understand it in the concept where you are. But to see that there is indeed a very common theme across the board that are there on this webinar, even outside. I thought I saw somebody even from Brazil, and I have recently have had connections uh, in the country of Brazil, and uh, you know, not to talk about it today, but it is cultural outreach. So policy, we talk about the cultural policy and we say, well, it's documented somewhere, okay? In our Kenyan situation, there was one policy by Pondo in 2010. And looking at these, there are five, you know, identified areas. Uh, and looking at them, a lot of them we have achieved, but some of them, I think we still struggle. Um, but, you know, there is always the thought that we can go back and see what are we doing good or what are we not, what are we failing not to effect very well. One of them is to create a central research body. And I, we do have that. I saw uh, Dr. Mushira in, the, in, in our midst. They related or associated with the Presidential Music Commission. So the body is there, it was created, it continues with very important mandate for at least in our Kenyan environment. The idea of having music and dance available in educational institutions. And I think we have put mentioned there are several scholars who have written about that. Access to concert and festivals. I believe we have also you know, come across that and I, it's work in progress. But even without going through that, all of them five points for raising the cultural policy, I would still say that there is still some gray areas. There are areas that are not very clear where we need to go. Just a few days, I walked into a, a body that is supposed to act as the, the, the intellectual property, you know, keeper. Or that includes music, includes you know patent, and we are in discussion. But I want to say that what surprised me most is the I don't want to call it failure to understand, but it's a miscommunication of some sort to understand what is our of art, you know what is called now art, art works. We could not, the, there was some misunderstanding and some, though we explained and we have explained for some time, there is still questions so that there is a next meeting to be able to meet the gentleman and somebody else to talk about it. What does it mean to put a piece of work? By the way, my area of uh, spe uh, specialization is composition. To write these works, how we then bring them to the house for intellectual property. But regarding the culture, I have the 2010 upon the, then there is 2022. Uh, somebody here, uh, let's see, Okal, he refers to culture. This is 2022, and he says indigenous languages is now focused on indigenous languages that they are supposed to be taught from primary to secondary schools. Well, remember my bone of contention. So are we succeeding there or not? In South Africa, I know they do have uh, works up all the way to PhD in Sizuru, and I think another language, the students can uh, undertake their studies and actually write them in those languages. I've sat in many boards, you know, of defense, and when documents are presented in Kiswahili, it is a labor for some members to be able to, to get into the document the meaning. So that is what this gentleman says. But he says there are challenges. One of them is, is inadequate, skilled human resources, lack of teaching resources. It's a familiar song, we have heard that. So as we enter as a chair, Dr. Mose talked about in Kenya, we are now dealing with 
competency-based curriculum. And by the way, music has always been that. Write something about the drum of the instrument, and yet you cannot play it. You have to do it. It's called efficacy. You have to be able to do it. With regards to art education, I was looking at uh, Akuno and et al. You know, 2021, and they talk about very nice things about what art education is about. So I'm not going to it in the um, too much in depth because this information will be shared. But one of them that I want to highlight is the, to create an excellent framework for personality development, learning knowledge, learning skills, and learning life. So the idea of culture, what does it come to do? Thinking about the meaning in life, CBC. I hope we are doing that and we are actually looking at that. The context, context of uh, this sustainable development, Jora did uh, conduct a research about the nature, it's called the culture and its cooperative relationship with creative industries. And there are questions, many questions that I found, you know, glaring that has not happened. So in the interest of time, let me say that many scholars or many speakers have talked about the idea of decolonizing music policies. Okay. So my questions are who is going to be the leader of this decolonizing? Okay. Who is coming to decolonize? What are their credentials? Okay. I am participating in an environmental program about this idea of decolonizing knowledge. So, and my point is about knowing this person that is a performer of a traditional instrument and you walk to them and you interview them. What about their knowledge? Because in the academia, we seem to, sometimes we seem to be dependent on knowledge from the books, but what about their way of knowledge? It's a different way of knowing and remember the statement I read at the beginning, the idea of wisdom. In academia, we call it something else. But then we to decolonize, yes. How do we know that we are actually decolonizing? And how is it going to be different from the way research has been colonized? This, the scholarly research. If we now need to decolonize the idea of policies, who sits at that table? Who asks the questions? How do we validate our own knowledge? And I'll stop here in the interest of time so that my colleague can continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Njora. Um, we have Dr. Mukasa Wafula. Dr. Wafula? Dr. Wafula Mukasa? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? All right. Yes, we can hear you. Proceed. Proceed. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Mose, for leading this session very well. I first of all apologize that there could be some background music from my end because I'm in a festival somewhere and I have just found a, a tree where I'm hiding so that I can also make a contribution to this. And I would like also to say a big thank you to Professor Akuno for having brought us together. This has been a very, very, very enlightening moment. How I wish it Um, Dr. Wafula. It could be internet strength. Right, right. Okay. Um, he also appears to have lost his audio. Mukasa, can you try and talk again? Oh dear.
I've just alerted him that we cannot hear him. He might need to move to another tree <laughs> where there's better reception. Uh, so maybe Carol, you could we could have a bit of comments. Yes, from um, uh, from the participants. Yes. Thank yes. You. So um, as we wait to see if Dr. Wafula will resume um, and come back to us, I would like to open this up to uh, everyone who is here. Um, in case you have any questions, you have any comments or any or something you would like to add or to pontificate about, please just, you can put up your hand uh, using the reaction button uh, on your screens and we will give you the mic to ask whichever questions you would like to ask. Mose, I can see uh, Dr. Fuller online. Uh, Mukasa, can you can you try and say something? We we'll see if we can hear you now. Not yet. Okay. He's online. He's online, but looks like he looks like online because his microphone is not here. Yes, I think he's lost his audio. Okay. Okay, um, anyone with any questions, any comments, any, any, anything you'd like to add, uh, feel free, just put up your hand and um, then we will call your name and you will unmute your mic and ask a question or make your contribution. Oh, I see uh, Dr. Wafula, if your mic is now working, please unmute it. Oh, he seems to have disappeared again. Right, uh, Dr. Wafula seems to have dropped off um, a little. Any questions or any comments um anyone would like to 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 make this is your opportunity uh feel free to feel free to ask your question you can put up your hand unmute your mic and proceed As, as we're waiting for people to pluck up courage, Jane Wahoo wrote something in the chat. Uh, Jane, if you're still here, do you just want to voice that loudly so that we can hear something about uh, theatre for development? Oh, yeah. Hello. Uh, yes, I'm here. Um, I think um, in your presentation, you 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 discussed um, the theater for development yes theater for development is is um, one of the many ways that theater is practiced this is where the the act is taken to the community and um, the issues that are highlighted in the act um, are issues that um, affect the community in one way or another so um, issues such as social change peace um you know um uh, yes, politics. So um, I've recently, we recently have been participating in uh, one of the programs, um, which is uh, now Forum Theatre. Um, Forum Theatre is, is a nicer way to, um, you know, to, to refer to the, the program. So uh, we're taking this to the community and actually some of the issues that you highlighted where now the community uh, participates in the program and there is no impo imposing, you're not imposing any values, you let the community come up with a solution for themselves. So the, the community becomes spectators who are actors. Um, so um, at some point after the professionals have done their thing, then the audiences who is a community comes in and uh, gives solution for a theme that has been presented by a facilitator. So with, in this way, the audience or the community does not feel as though you came to impose on them. They, they feel that they own the solutions. 
So that has been a very, you know, is a, is a very important way, is a critical way to reach um, some uh, art is being used to tackle some of society's problems by actually just showing the community that yes, um, the solutions are not to come from anywhere else, but you have the solutions, you hold the solutions. So uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, Professor Kun. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Mose. All right. Um, thank you very much, Jin uh, Wahu Kerago, for that. Um, and just to add that the ideas around forum theater uh, can actually be ascribed or can be traced back to uh, the work of Augusto Boal and Paulo Freire, um, who were Brazilian scholars and thinkers. Um, I see we have two hands up. Uh, we will begin with the policy of ladies first. So Evelyn Mushira, you will ask your question, followed by, um, uh, I, I know I'm pronouncing your name very wrong, and I apologize for that, followed by Borges uh, Gove. Evelyn, you can unmute your mic and ask your question or make your comment. Evelyn, Evelyn Mushira, are you still with us? I can see your hand is up. Evelyn? Evelyn uh, appears perhaps, or Evelyn, yes. Even, oh, yes, go ahead, please. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Evelyn Mushira. Uh, I serve at the Permanent Presidential Music Commission. Um, an institution, a government institution that is charged with uh, policy making. That's one of the mandates that we carry. And I sit at a very interesting uh, stage in my uh, music education career. I've taught in the classroom. I've taught at the university. I've headed uh, Kenyatta University at some point, uh, championing the beginning of the curriculum uh, review process. And now I find myself at the confluence where we are, we've, we've uh, produced the first music policy, the national music policy in Kenya, uh, 2021, having also a revised cultural pro policy in place uh, and also within the education policy. We have a program that we refer to as the Talent uh, Development Program for music in the country. And it goes around the country tapping into uh, the, the different youths who've not had an advantage of sitting in formal classrooms so that they can just push their music competencies a notch higher uh, to then be able to participate fully in the music spaces, particularly the music industry spaces. And uh, I think I just want to uh, tap on to something that Professor Kuno uh, highlighted in her presentation. Uh, what she would like to see, uh, like uh, uh, the promotion of certain cultural values within the music education setup. Uh, friends, I would like to report that I've seen this at work, especially because we then make the, the schemes of work that operate within the program to be very, very centered in the cultural resources of the different uh, regions that we travel. We normally go to uh, regions uh, that then share uh, strong musical cultural backgrounds. And we've seen these things at play. Uh, I've seen certain principles of the competency-based uh, uh, curriculum uh, principles at work. When we put up such programs, um, we see participants uh, having the values of uh, collaboration, self-awareness, creation, uh, uh, artistic creation, and yet having very, very great respect for the musical resources, the materials uh, from the different uh, cultural backgrounds. I think for me, uh, it's just a comment and to say, um, Kenya is at a very good place where then the policy framework has expanded and actually given a nod towards music education, because then having the first uh, music policy uh, uh, at work, then gives us uh, more pathways to be able to 
um, explore uh, for the sake of music uh, education. And I hope we will come up with models out of these talent programs that then can serve uh, other aspects of the music education program. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Evelyn Mushira. Before, um, uh, uh, I know I'm saying your name wrong again, and I apologize, Borges and Praxedes, you ask your questions. I would like to, uh, in looking at the panel, uh, recognize the presence of uh, the head of school that actually houses the Department of Music and, performance and, and, and Performing Arts at the uh, Technical University of Kenya, Professor Odoch Pido, uh, we see you and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. Right. Um, so I would like to ask, <laughs> I would like to ask uh, Borges Gove and Praxedes Rosina to proceed and ask their questions. Well, uh, I hope I hope Prashed is like, agrees that um, that I go first. Men first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this is not a, a question. Uh, I, I I raised my hand because I felt like people were not raising their hands and that the room, you know, was empty. Then while I have some thoughts, I mean, broad from all these discussions, one thing that I felt like we all share has to do with the cultural policies. And within these cultural policies, uh, I, I'll refer to it as a, the political a political document. The same thing has the curriculum is also a political document. So since both reflect policy, the, the one thing that probably is, 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 is failing, one of the failures, in my point of view, at least in the context of Mozambique, is that the stakeholders, the main stakeholders, the grassroots, you know, the, the communities are not consulted before conceiving this these documents for for example we have um we have a law which is called uh, in portuguese um laid mecenato laid mecenato is the law that allows that if a company for example an enterprise sponsors an artist or a, a cultural event he will be you know his taxes something like that which has been conceived long ago and it's not working. This has not worked. We are also revising the cultural policy, but the, the, the grassroots are not heard. The artists, the, 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 the people who work directly with those things. The same happens when curriculum is designed. The, the, the books, for example, the curriculum for primary schools before music education has been drawn out of the curriculum has from this year has contents that even the teachers could not teach and had contents of traditional, I mean, politically well-spoken was traditional music, but not specified what music, who is going to teach, how is going to teach. So I th think this is one of the things that it probably we need advocacy on it. So we are consulted before conceiving these political documents. Thank you. This was my comment, my point, my, yeah, my contribution, one contribution. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your comment. I'm actually reminded that in our Kenyan curriculum, which I mentioned before, um, has come under fire because it um, it was, it's been in play now for about five, about four or five years. There's been a lot, it's come under a lot of fire because of the same, same issues where traditional music um, is taught within, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the music course itself. 
but there have been a lot of issues where the the learners are given assignments to go and learn and come and present a traditional song. And part of that has been the criticism that no traditional songs were being done as necessarily as solos, you know, and the students and learners are told to, to come and improvise. And you, you know, it's how do you improvise uh, your traditions and your traditional dress and clothing. So that has become one of... <laughs> Uh, my apologies for that. Proxidis, please proceed and ask your question. Um, thank you, uh, Moz. Um, to me, it's not like a, a, a question. Uh, I'm also in the same route with Borg. I also wanted to, to present that, to add some something on, on what we have already said related to cultural uh, police. Um, in Mozambique, uh, for us, um, our first police was uh, introduced in 1997 after um, uh, a new uh, constitution was adopted in 1990. So uh, this, uh, when the government adopted this, um, uh, introduced this, this policy, its main aim was to, 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 to to bring all, 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 the, all, all its people together um, to make sure that the, 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 the culture itself is being, is being uh, respected. So it's like in, in this policy states that um, the cultural policy is a tool uh, that um, uh, regulates government activity in, in its uh, relation with other, with other partners. So it's like, um, also, in our primary primary education, as Boj was saying, um, in order to give value to our languages, to our native languages, we also introduced some um, native languages in in the in the classroom, so that all the students are able to to learn um, how to read and write. Because the minister minister of education, its aim is to ensure that all students in primary education acquire the ability of reading, writing, and calculation. So it's like, um, since we have the uh, poor resources on how to make, uh, to put students right uh, through through using our, uh, using Portuguese, most of our students in, 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 um, in remote areas, they use their uh, native languages. So it's like when they are exposed to Portuguese, their production has been also very, very weak. So it's like uh, to, in order to overcome this, this, this type of, 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 uh, of challenges in our education, we introduced um, the bilingual education where our students learn all the contents from the, uh, from in the um, first cycle, which is from grade one to three using Portuguese, uh, I mean, using their native languages. Then from there is where there is this transition from grade three to grade four, where they start learning the contents in, in Portuguese. So it's like uh, all those issues related to culture, to, to bring together the, 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 the population is being is being used this that is being used this these native languages to 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 make to make so that everyone can be able to to use the language appropriately uh, uh, and using these dif different different I mean different songs different music uh, instruments so the students are able to acquire different abilities. So um, uh, an another uh, uh, issue that I wanted to, to, to bring uh, as a question is related to Ghana. Since in our country, it's a very big challenge to bring uh, arts in the classroom due to our, uh, 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 to our um, I mean, poor resources. Uh, I mean, uh, looking at the uh, human resources itself, uh, teachers who are well to, to teach, uh, uh, for example, music, to teach arts in the classroom. So how do they um, go about it 
in Ghana uh, uh, so that we can also use their good practices or their experiences to make a change in our, in, in our country. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those very um, insightful comments. Um, I see Emmanuel Ashene. I hope I'm pronouncing your name well. Uh, Emmanuel, your hand is up. Please, uh, you can unmute your mic and ask your question. Okay, thank you very much. I believe you can hear me clearly. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, my question or comment is uh, especially for the Kenyan, for our uh, situation in Kenya, most of these policies, cultural policies in relation to education, I feel uh, like most educators, we meet them when we are out there in the field. Is there a way maybe for us to engage maybe as students at tertiary level to be able to engage early in the discussion about cultural policies? Can it be maybe put in our curriculums? Because in my own experience, I, I've, I've not had such an encounter. So at least, I mean, it's just a question to our professors out there. Is there a way we can actually start engaging with this discussion about policymakers, cultural policies, while we are still at the tertiary level? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Manuel, for that comment. Um, I, I think I would be happy to say that uh, for the Technical and University of Kenya, we do have courses um, around creative economy uh, in the Department of Music and Performing Arts that do tackle some of the issues that you're talking about. Uh, we do have uh, sessions with uh, people from the industry, people from the PPMC, interacting with our students at that level, at the, at, at the master's level as well, to address some of uh, these issues on cultural policy that you are talking about. So indeed, there are efforts at the current level, um, at least within our, within, uh, our department, to address some of these. Uh, can there be more concerted effort to do that? Absolutely, absolutely. So your point is well taken. Um, I see I Agri Nganyi with um, your hand up. Evelyn Mushira. Evelyn, wh were you, wh did, wh did you want to respond to the question that has just been asked? Uh, by Or wh was it a new question? So um, uh -huh. Evelyn, if you'd like to respond. Yes, go ahead, Evelyn, and then we'll have Agri. Thank you, Dr. Mose. I just, uh, in relation to the uh, newly launched music policy, uh, it's a new thing. It's the first of its type you find in the country. And I uh, just want to let Emmanuel know that uh, the State Department for Culture and Heritage is in plans to sensitize, take the policy around the country so that many other people are exposed the practitioners, the music educators, and all other stakeholders. So yeah, from PPMC, we have that plan in place and we will let uh, everybody know when the sensitization workshops are near you. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for that comment. Yeah. Agri, um, did some, was someone else speaking? Uh, let Agri, uh, Gany, whose hand is up, ask his question. And then I'm not sure who is speaking. I can't see. Uh, it's who Luca. It's Luca. Oh, Luca. All oh, right. Right. Yeah. Right. After. Later. I speak. Uh, yeah. okay. oh, After. I agree. All right. I agree. Ask your question, and then and then we are going to. Um. Hello, everyone. Um. Uh. I'm just coming in to really recognize the presenters of today for very informative uh, presentations. Um, a special mention, I thought we need to mention uh, the Ghanaian presenters. I was uh, particularly emotional about the history of policy formulation and curriculum development in Ghana from very, very early times up to date. And um, my, my special comment is that uh, 
uh, I was emotional in that Kenya, in Kenya here, we have not had that strong history of uh, policy formulation and curriculum uh, from early days up to now. And I want to just uh, uh, find out about the leadership of these policies, who are the leaders, who are the champions, and uh, uh, particularly if there is mention of uh, the impact, the impact that this for uh, development, long history of curriculum policy formulation and development uh, has had on the music of Ghana, especially African music. At, at times I feel miserable here in Kenya because uh, uh, I, I teach at the university and uh, I'm, I'm very emotional about African music, but the champions and the, the, the popular phrase around here is that of uh, Western music. Our students want to specialize in Western music because it has some market. That, that's what they think, that they go to train a musical instrument out there and make some money. And so they, they campaign. And it is uh, becoming a challenge to market African music beyond the borders of Kenya, because they think, uh, most, most feel that, that uh, yeah, this one has money, ready money out there. You, you play piano, you train students, uh, family, children, some, some piano or, or trumpet, and you make quick money, peripatetic teaching. And, and um, 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 that's why I'm coming to Ghana. I, I know this, they have a very strong African music practice there. Could this a long history of policy and curriculum development uh, has had that impact of a strong uh, African music uh, practice. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Agri, for for that. Um, I think a question uh, that 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 should be a question. Uh, before we have someone answer, uh, we did have uh, we did have somebody who wanted to speak. I think that was uh, was it Luca? Yeah. Yes, please. Um, yeah. Dr. Luca, please. Uh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, my comment is very much in line with Agri's. Uh, well, I, through my work, it's also, I try to also show this, but I'm really very much concerned. We are talking, we talk a lot about getting this African music into the, uh, into the education system or even uh, promote it in the communities and uh, um, have maybe the same weight, you know, as Western music is. Actually, it should have more weight than Western music. Everyone starts, when you talk of education, you start from inside going out, you know, you start from within yourself, what you know, you stimulate this and this enables you to understand what comes uh, from, from, from far. And, I, I'm really uh, worried about, uh, we're talking here about sustainability. And my question is, this, this point that has just been presented by Agri that yeah, uh, most of our students want to do uh, a trumpet, want to do piano because they can quickly make money. It's really um, a very strong challenge um, that policymakers should take into consideration because um, it's perpetuating a dependence on the West. I mean, yeah, people tell me today that, okay, we are universalizing music, we're universalizing the instruments, but of course, this concept of universalizing, we are just universalizing the Western culture while we are really keeping ours each, each time remote and remote and down. So one challenge, we have, for example, there are lots of programs where instruments are being donated. Most of the times it's second hand, some of them broken, uh, you know, that stayed in the backyards in Europe in their houses because they don't need them. Someone collects and donates them. But you realize, of course, at first hand, we think this is a good thing for us. Yeah, it is to a certain point. But then if we do nothing to counteract this situation, it means 
we are continuing to, to kill our ability, our instinct to, to respond to this, to this need in our society. I mean, I call it instinct, uh, maybe to give it more weight, but uh, you know, that ability to really tackle our problems, we're getting used that someone else is going to give us the solution. Someone is going to tell us what we should think now. And I, I, I think there we still have, a, we still have a, big, a big challenge. For me, it's important in the case of music, but also the other artistic discipline. I think it's important that we really invest seriously uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the construction of musical instruments that can be used in, in our schools for, uh, for the education system to be sustainable. You cannot sustain, you cannot uh, plow your farm always with a borrowed or a, you know, a borrowed plow. You must have your own plow because when the season to plow comes, then you know the owner needs it. And, and uh, it's not affordable, it's economically, it's economically not sustaining us because we have to buy and we have to use forex. And so if we build, if we invest in building our own, then we can really build an economy also, which is sustainable, a practice which can really last uh, locally. That, that, was my, that was my point. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you very much uh, for that comment. Um, uh, I don't know if uh, anyone would like to respond to that, but I do see that uh, we are now a little bit or like 10 minutes over our time. So um, if there is no any further response to these issues that have been raised, um, because we actually, uh, you know, th these are very pertinent issues, I would like to, because I see no other hand up, I would like to hand this back over to Professor Akuno and perhaps as we wind up, Professor Akuno, you could make a statement or two regarding these issues that have just been raised um, at the end. Uh, and to everyone, I've been your moderator. Uh, my name is Caroline Mose. Thank you very much uh, for joining us and thank you very much for your patience. Um, uh, uh, Professor Akuno, uh, the mic is now back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mose. Before I proceed, Mariga Agatha, that's, um, you have a sentence? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I have also been very, uh, always very worried about uh, the way we go about uh, the use of Western music in our curriculum. I think we will not be doing much to ourselves if we finish all these beautiful discussions and go back and continue with the same curriculum that we have been working on, which has been westernizing our music. Um, I mean, we can take examples from Asia, for example, that they, they, they have so, uh, you know, worked on their traditional music that even in their orchestras, their traditional music plays in their traditional orchestra uh, uh, instruments. So I think we should also encourage ourselves to begin to work on our instruments, to bring them to light. I know like in the Eastern part of Africa, we have a lot of string instruments. You know, in the Western part of Africa, we have a, a lot of uh, 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 drumming instruments and so on, south and so on. If we begin to harness these instruments and begin to put them together in order to, and then begin to put them in our curriculum, because our curriculars are just so westernized and uh, we keep prioritizing these Western instruments and so on. I was trained in the Western world, yes, but that doesn't mean I should remain there. So we can still get the knowledge, use that knowledge, and then improve in our, uh, on our own curricula. Let us begin to change our curricula so that we begin to encourage our children to appreciate their uh, traditional instruments, to appreciate their traditional ways of doing things musically and, of course, theater-wise too. Thank you. Thank you. I see my students hand up. And uh, if I don't let her say a sentence, she may not come back to class. But uh, uh, Eric, Eric, Eric has a comment, um, and he's saying let's keep the conversation going further. And his email address is there. But I think there's something else that we will do, which will allow us to continue this conversation. Aflin, a sentence. 
Okay, thank you so much, Prof. I hope you can hear me. Yes, um, you can. Yeah, I really, really wanted to um, say that this is a good forum and I've learned a lot. And maybe something that I've noted from my side, I am a teacher and um, I happen to teach the IGCSE curriculum, which, are, which is an international curriculum. Maybe I would like just to point out to uh, what everyone is saying that you find in this curriculum, they allow us, they allow every region to like, you're, you can explore your instrument you can use your own, like we can have an African instrument and present it for an exam. But unfortunately, you find that most of the students are not encouraged or do not want to participate in this kind of forum. So I, I just want to say it starts with us. The platform thank is you. there. But let it start with us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, that is my cue. Uh, the question that I will ask uh, colleagues is, who owns the curriculum? Please don't answer. Who owns the curriculum? Who has the authority to articulate the curriculum? Or rather, who has the responsibility to articulate the curriculum? I want to believe that most governments, most education departments invite practicing teachers to the table to discuss matters of the curriculum. It, a lot of times it is crafted and several times it is made available for input, for stakeholder input, not always, but several times it is made available for stakeholder input. I'd just like to encourage us that even if you're not in the panel that is developing the curriculum, you let your voice be heard. One time, uh, I remember we had challenges with the same when I was still working at Kenyatta University. And the question was, we did not have resources. Where resources were textbooks. And a challenge went out that we go out, we go out for research. We used, you know, the students used to go out every, every year for, uh, a field, for field work. The challenge was to document that and start using that as our text, as our textbooks. So I think it comes back to us. And maybe that is going to be step two of what we have. Carol, that is all that I'd like to say in response to, to those questions. Um, allow me then to go to the next bit of appreciating everybody. When we sent, when I sent this proposal to UNESCO. I said we anticipated about 30 people. Today, cumulatively, we have been 70 or just under 70 or just over 70. Of course, people come in and drop off. Uh, the highest number that I counted was 57, but that was after some people had dropped off. So it is not a small matter. I want to appreciate you. We've had representation, I think from the UK, Maria, uh, from Brazil, from Ghana, Gracie Kong is in, you're not in Ghana, you must be in Nigeria. I'm telling you something about my geography. We've got, we've got Mozambique, we've got Kenya. May I just ask everybody to please uh, turn on your, your video, turn on your camera. And anybody who is able to take a screenshot, please do. And then keep moving so that we take as many as we can. If somebody can take a screenshot, Juliana is just entering. Okay, how many have we taken so far? All right, if you've taken the screenshots, please please do share them with us so that we can, we can report that we have been there. And, and Danny has not put her name, but you're just iPhone Danny. That looks like... Um, who is this? This is Winnie. <laughs> okay. So, so that, that was the first thing, just to appreciate everybody coming from all places and looking really good. This to me tells me of the resources that we have on the continent and beyond to make arts education 
culturally significant, speak for us, speak to our situation and inform our realities. Thank you so much. The proposal to UNESCO, uh, they asked us uh, what the output might be. The outcome is all of us being here and, and sharing, sharing ideas, ETC, and I really appreciate that. But the output, and I did propose that we could have a publication out of this. So it is not going to be rumors because you're hearing from me. I hereby, shall I use very official language? I hereby invite you to submit an abstract towards a book publication whose title will be the title of what we've just done today. What is it? Arts Education, Informing policy, Cultural Policies and Sustainable Development. That would be the title of the publication. So I'd like to request you to please think about it seriously. If you could send me an abstract before Christmas day, <laughs> that is 24th of December, 2022, where are you going to send it to? In the chat box, I am putting an official email address, emily.akuno at t-u-k-e-n-y-a dot a-c dot k-e. Uh, the e is a small e, it's not a big e. So that is the email address that I would wish for you to send that abstract to. The uh, three times three, nine, the nine presentations that we've had today will be chapters in the book. So colleagues, uh, you keep writing. It would be good to hear from everybody who has been in attendance. I would love my head of school to do the preface or the forward, Professor Deutsch, Thank I'm you. sorry. Yeah, you, you can clean me tomorrow in the village, not in Nairobi. No problem. The students Thank are you. Here. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yes, yes, Prof. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I wish we could do a little more. Yes, please. Let us start small the way we have now started. Mm -hmm but we could have easily included the other apps. Yes. But let's start here. And- uh, Thank you. I, I, I am very, very grateful to you, my colleagues in, uh, in the university. I will not mention everyone by name, but I, I stayed on and I've listened very, very carefully to every presentation, every question. And uh, I believe, like someone said, I have learned a lot. And uh, thank you so much for this type of meeting. I hope we will have another one and another one and another one and another one before my gray hair falls off. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. <laughs> thank you. So that was the first announcement. Thank you so much, Prof. You're, you're, you're a gem, thank you. The second announcement is that March 14th to 16th, 2023, by God's grace, 2023, March 14th to 16th, that week, we should be having a postgraduate student seminar. Heavily music, but we shall not leave out the other arts. So you who are supervising postgraduate students and you who are graduate students, please, the same email address, just send a note to say that you would like to be, to, to participate. Um, uh, we are still working out the logistics, but we have some friends who will be visiting us uh, from the US, from the University of Florida, and uh, uh, we will get some presentations from them. The format would be somebody can generally talk about, indicate what their topic area is and they get some feedback, but also we expect to get some uh, presentations the way we have just had and, and you know some good discussion, but focusing on 
heavily on postgraduate students. So if you have a student who is kind of not understanding you, bring them, <laughs> bring them. There will be many more ears to help you understand them. So those are my two uh, announcements. And finally, I would like to ask, again, I mentioned that two of my professors were in the house. Professor Jean Kidola, I believe, has had to run away, but Professor Njora is still with us and was very gracious to be one of the uh, participants. I'm going to ask uh, again, Professor Dodge, I'm sorry, I'm coming back to you now as uh, the head of the academic division that I belong to, to kindly officially close this forum for us. Prof, are you there? Yes. I, I think you can hear me now. Yes, we um, can. I, I, um, you are putting me on the spot because I don't know whether to close or, or just keep on uh, the door open for us. Um, it's very difficult to close uh, this kind of conversation because even if we close, as, as the, um, uh, the colonizers would say, it is time for it to end, the conversation will still go on in our minds and in our hearts. But let us do the necessary. We have been here for slightly over two hours. So maybe you can now, all of us, allow me to bring this meeting to a close with uh, a word of prayer. Uh, I hope that I'm not offending anybody, but uh, Professor Kuno, can you give us a word of prayer for the closer? And I will not say anything after that. We will assume that it is closed with that word of prayer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Father most holy, our gracious King and Savior, Lord God of hosts, you have been good to us. You have sustained us. Our gadgets kept going on and going off, but you brought us right back and you've seen us through a very exciting afternoon of discussions. I just come back and say thank you because I know I did ask you to let it work out and I believe you have answered my prayer. I want to thank you for all these colleagues from all over the world who have participated in this forum. And I pray, dear Lord, that you'll give us the courage to make changes in our deliberations in terms of education so that what we do and what we subject our learners to will be meaningful to them and will bring development so that people might know that the things that we do are not just a passing cloud, but they're significant to us and to our development. Thank you for the riches of your blessings of culture that spell out who we are, that define us, and that enable us to carry out various responsibilities. As we close this particular forum, I do pray, dear Lord, that what we have had may be a beginning and not an end, and that you bless our efforts Grace us with your blessings. In Jesus' precious name, I have asked and believe. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Amen. And, Bye. And, Bye. And, uh, and kudos to Dr. Mose. You've done a fantastic job. Thank you so much. Yes. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Bye, Bye. Bye Professor Njora. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.